Welcome to the Warships Podcast with your host, Kellorn, Venacera, and Aaron. Hello, and welcome to episode 134 of the Warships Podcast. I'm your host, Keller, and Arun and Venacera are here with me to welcome Lord Zath back to the show. It's been a while since we've had you on, Zath. How have things been going? Oh, it's kind of a bad time to be asking that kind of question <laughs> with uh, Ranked on, but otherwise, everything's been going fine. So I believe I was told that you've been invited uh, to the CC Summit this month in St. P- Petersburg. Are you excited to, to go? Well, I am excited now that I can officially state that I am going because my visa arrived this morning. So yes, I am incredibly excited to be attending. That's awesome. Well, I'm really glad that you uh, get to get to go and I hope you guys have as good a time as that Aaron and I had last year. <laughs> Thanks. I'm really looking forward to it. So with, uh, with Lord Zath here, we wanted to, he was one of the leaders of the, the Kraken Clan Battles team. And we wanted to have a quick recap of the most recent season of Clan Battles before we talk about, you know, that super salty rank battle stuff that's going to be, uh, that we'll talk about in a minute. So Zath, what went right and what went wrong last season in Clan Battles, in your opinion? So what went right, in my opinion, uh, was the cross-server uh, setup. I really, really enjoyed being able to play against other teams outside North America, especially for us, we did it on Sundays. Um, Saturdays, people wanted to keep it still in a prime time. But I liked how it gave us that flexibility, um, even to be able to tell people, hey, if we get seven people on, we'll start on at this time. But if we don't, no worries, we'll try again, you know, during regular NA hours. So I like that a lot. As far as uh, problems, you know, we, we were dealing with burnout, I think, for the first time in a while. People still felt it was the same thing over and over again. Once again, Tier 10, once again, 7v7. Uh, once again, one battleship allowed. And the maps themselves are very well known. And it got to the point where, oh, God, here we go again, you know. Um, so it felt like there wasn't a whole lot of variety in the season outside of the, the cross server. So I, I did hear the complaints about burnout, uh, in clan battles, and I was actually going to ask you about that next. So, you know, what are your thoughts on how to fix that burnout going forward? Well, for one, very up the tier, make it something different and unique. Everybody knows the Henri at tier 10 is like the best flanking cruiser you can possibly get. Um, to the point where it's edged out other ships. And I think one of the problems that we run into, it said, especially at Tier 10, is you end up with this meta that develops where if you don't have that meta ship, then uh, you feel like you are you know, a detriment to your team. You're not helping them um, when you take, say, a Hindenburg instead of an Henri. Um, and you know, it, it took a, a, some some coaxing to tell people in my clan specifically with crack and say, Hey, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Bring the ship that you want, bring the ship that you feel most comfortable in and let's go to town and see what happens. Uh, a great example of that was uh, Zampi and the Shimakaze. Um, that's one of his most favorite and comfortable ships to play. And um, yet at the same time, you know, the daring was the meta ship. Um, yet he was still able to take that ship and just, do zampy things. And we won lots of games because of that. So I, I think um, while ships do matter, I, it's uh, it's the player that matters ultimately. And um, we, we're just getting tired of the same old tools, if that makes any sense. No, I, I do get that. And I actually played the Shimikaze in, you know, uh, as well for the Kraken team uh, in place of Zampi when Zampi wasn't around. And I actually found that the Shimikaze was quite adept at... Um, stopping he- on re rushes. So, you know, when you, when you had those three on re's rushing aside, you could put the Shimakaze over there and just kind of force them to slow down and force them to, to, and, and be able to do something about it. So, well, Shimakaze wasn't necessarily a meta ship. It certainly was effective against the metas that we were seeing. Yeah, I would agree with that. And that's, the, that's one of the cool things is that, um, you know, every ship does have a place. It's just how you use it really. So Zath, next season, we very well may see aircraft carriers in clan battles. And given how they've been acting in randoms and rank battles since the most recent patch, how would you intend to use a carrier in a, in, in a clan battle? And do you expect teams to actually forego using a carrier? No, those are some interesting questions. Um, I would say a carrier in a clan battle gives an awful lot of spotting and it would almost, I would almost say it replaces a destroyer in the lineup. 
Um, sorry, Zampi. <laughs> but um, when I think of carriers in a clan battle scenario, I think of teams that have to work really tightly together, um, groups of two or even three splitting off and, um, you know, overlapping A auras, all that good stuff. Uh, I see aircraft carriers as punishing, flanking attacks and maneuvering. Um, and at the same time, I also see carrier, especially with Hakuryu, as punishing stagnant play. Um, and this is, I think, one area that might be a breath of fresh air, essentially, for clan battles is in the last season, it was very common. You end up with a Des Moines in the Des Moines spot. And the Des Moines spends the entire game in the Des Moines spot. And it's such a uh, frustrating experience trying to dislodge that ship. Um, that's one nice thing, I guess, about carriers is uh, you, you can't just, you know, drop anchor and be there on your own. Uh, as far as your question about why a team would forego a carrier, honestly, I don't know why a team would choose to do that. Right now, at least the way anti-air is working, it does not seem to be enough to ward off a carrier. So I think the opportunity cost of dropping that carrier for an extra CV or sorry, extra destroyer or an extra cruiser just, in my opinion, does not compute. So in terms of what carriers to take, which one would you, do you expect the Hakuryu to be the, the go-to? Do you expect Midway or even Audacious? We've already seen the Hakuryu flexing its muscles in ranked. And in ranked, you have to keep in mind that there's an unknown number of battleships allowed. And so you can have games where there's six battleships. You can have games where there's one. You could have games when there's zero. And with clan battles, you can have games with one or zero, and that's it. So I think the Hakuryu becomes even more valuable as more cruisers enter the mix. So yes, I think the Hakuryu is going to be the number one. I think Midway is going to be number two. The problem with Audacious is that the rockets don't do enough penetration damage. They've got decent fire chance, and they're pretty good against destroyers. But if you're replacing destroyer with carrier, and you don't need a destroyer, well, then what's the point? You also have to keep in mind with the Audacious that she doesn't have armor, or doesn't have a proper armored deck, meaning that she can take a lot of damage from the other CV, unlike, well, the other CVs. Audacious rockets on the deck of a Midway do nothing. A midway rockets on an Audacious can do quite a lot of damage if they hit the right spots. So, Arun, one of the things that I, I've seen... So, try and contain your shot, guys, but I've been playing Hakuryu in in Ranked a little bit, and I'll get into why in just a little <gasps> bit when we talk about Ranked. Uh, but, I one, I've had a real hard time with the um, the the rocket planes on Hakuryu because of how far out that target is. So hitting destroyers, you often, your, your target is past where it is when, uh, when you're, you know, trying to, to, when, when you detect that destroyer, but also, you know, I, I do agree, you know, the reason I'm playing it is because of the, of the AP, you know, dive bombers on, on cruisers and stuff. But, you know, I, I find that Hakuryu, you know, that there, there are the people that try and snipe me in it, just, it doesn't work. Like if you try and snipe the uh, other carrier, then that's pretty much I can almost guarantee that we're going to win that match because I'm spotting your point of uh, spotting your you know the other team rather than trying to go for the carrier. Well, with your problem of uh, having difficulty actually hitting with your rocket planes, what you do is you fly over the destroyer, then you drop a fighter plane if it's a stealthy air destroyer, and you know like turning their anti-air off. You fly them when you spot them. You drop a fighter plane on top of her. Then you fly away and do a proper attack from the long run. Because actually, if you deal with some certain destroyers, such as a Yuguma, uh, if they turn their entire off and then maneuver properly after you pass over them, you might not actually be able to guess where they're going to be. And I've had some quite a bit of trouble with a certain Yuguma once that I ran into, where I was simply... I had a lot of difficulty dealing damage to her because she did exactly that and I was too cheap at the time to use fighter planes on her, meaning that I probably wasted like a good five minutes on trying to kill her even though there was nothing around her to help her and it was like basically open water. So I think it's very important to drop the fighter on them and I think in rank that's just completely fine because uh, you don't need as many fighter planes since games usually don't go quite as long. Uh, so. I think it's fine. And on the point of uh, CVs trying to fight one another, um, I would 
I completely agree that if the enemy CV is attacking your CV, you're probably going to win because it takes so long for a CV to sink another CV that uh, the CV that's being attacked can simply deal enough damage to like two ships to basically sink them in the time that she would take damage from a single one. It's kind of different though when your deck armor can be penetrated by rocket planes because then the damage can add up very, very, very quickly. And something like an Audacious versus an Audacious is can go down pretty quickly because those bombs, I think, should be able to deal a lot of damage to one another. To be fair, I haven't done a lot of CV attacks uh, with my Hecker yet. Uh, mostly I've been focusing on the other ships in the game. Do, you, do the AP dive bombers from the Hecker not penetrate the, the armored deck of Midway and Hecker I don't actually remember that. Um, well, I remember that they don't, but I kind of find it difficult to believe that that's entirely the case. But I would say that it's still likely that they they might overpen though. So I don't remember. I'm sorry. Uh, something to test. So uh, the salty topic of the week is obviously ranked battles and specifically the rental ships and ranked battles. Over and over again, I've heard veteran players talk about how bad it is to have multiple rental ships on your team. And last week when you and I talked, Arun, I thought that the rental ships were a good idea and that it would make battles form faster and there wouldn't be much effect. Ah, boy, did I kind of get that wrong. But were you guys surprised at how many people have chosen to use rigged rental ships and ranked? And if that's the case, what's the difference between ranked and random battles anymore? I am actually surprised by how much complaining I saw about rental ships compared to how few of them I actually run into in practice. And the fact that I didn't run into a single rental ship that made me think like, oh boy, I wish I had, I wish, well, I know. Uh, you for know, this for guy example, wasn't in, the in game. one of the games that I like, was playing I in, we had a Shimikaze that, that was a rental on our team, and he insisted on using it as a gunboat against a Zao. And I'm like, what are you doing? So you ran into Strefs? No, no, I, didn't I thought he was on <laughs> EU. Did you switch to EU? I'm just joking. But, but, basi- but basically, I mean, yeah, it makes sense. But actually, now that I think about it, I do remember a specific uh, rental Shimakaze that sailed into the middle of the map and died. But we still won the game. Not due to thanks to her, though. Uh, and uh, actually, speaking of rental ships, if since I'm playing a Conqueror, mostly in ranked right now, with survivability expert, if I could put camo on my rental ships, I would be playing a rental Conqueror just to make people I mean, underestimate me. I, I get me. that, Arun. I mean, I, I, I do think there are probably some people out there that are doing stuff like that. But, you know, the, it, it's not so much when I see one rental on my team or one rental on the enemy team that that's usually not a big deal. But when you see, I I've seen three rentals on one team and two or, or three rentals on the other team, when you're getting close to half of the population of the game being in rentals, it's kind of a different ball game. Yeah. That's where statistics come into play. You should, you should be, you should have fewer rentals on your team than on the enemy team, because the enemy team can have seven random players. Your team can have six as long as you are not the uh, random player. Something to keep in mind, of course, is that uh, I think a lot of players, going back to your original question, Kalorn, I think a lot of players are looking at rentals as an opportunity to try out a ship that they don't have. And for a lot of people, the the real grind, if you don't have a ton of free XP and stuff available, the real grind is going to be from the tier 8 to the tier 9, and then from the tier 9 to the tier 10. So this is an opportunity for a lot of players to say, is it worth my time? To keep grinding up the line, I just got Bismarck. Do I want the Kerr first? Let's try it out in ranked. Um, and now that the public test is is going on, I think a, a lot of the same players now have another avenue to try something out. Um, so you know, I, I feel like the people that have that kind of a consideration, it's not such a big deal. Arun's point about a conqueror rental conqueror as a way to to mess with people. Of all the rental ships to take that has the the least um, a negative impact on your team would probably be the conqueror um, because who cares about dispersion of shells being shot at you and who cares about your 3% concealment bonus versus any destroyer in the game or like a Zao. Um, you know, those are obviously ships you probably want to stay away from as a rental. You know, all this makes me think back to, you know, wouldn't it maybe be better if ranked was just, you know, here's all the ships and you go in as you, your person, with ships already there, almost like not a player test, but um, you know, kind of like uh, 
think WoW had like the arena servers back in the day. You know, you go in, all the ships are there, all the captains are there, all the equipment's there, and you just go as, you know, you. You just, you know, pick what you want and go out there and show off your skill. Well, if we're going to have uh, dreams like that, I, I would actually like to see something like uh, the MOBA games, uh, League of Legends and Dota and whatnot do, where you go into the match and then you have picks and bans, where you pick a certain ship and that's what you're going to play. So you so so basically you can pick the, you know, counterpick what the enemy picks and they can counterpick you and all those things. I think it would add to some interesting type of gameplay. But actually, this is a system I would love to see in clan battles first, though, because then you could see, you know, certain teams doing strategies that they couldn't otherwise. Uh, for example, the Henri seems to be pretty much a staple. If you ban her, you know, maybe different strategies well, you know, open the, up. I, I think that's really interesting, Aaron, and, and is an idea that could really spice up the clan battle seasons. But I, I wanted to get back to my original question is... I'm starting to really see a blurring of the lines between random battles and ranked battles. And, and what I mean by that is that, you know, Wargaming has maintained that ranked battles is a way to show your solo skill. But at the same time, we I've always argued that ranked battles is not the way to show your solo skill because you are just one player on a team of seven and you don't get to pick uh, the other people that are on your team. So I, I find that aspect of of it to be very, very frustrating because it's not just me. I I understand what you're saying, but I would disagree with the main idea behind it because I think it is you. The problem we have with the current ranked season or current ranked system is that it's uh, it ends. Usually when you have these kinds of ratings algorithms and, for example, games like Dota, they will end, but they will last an entire year. So you have an entire year worth of matches to build up your ratings. So you get these distinct tiers of ratings where you know you can differentiate between better and worse players. Something like that happens in World of Warships with the uh, different, you know, the uh, ranked bracket. So two to five and uh, six to ten, etc. The problem is that it's so easy to get into the highest brackets that there's a massive skill gap between players. And the reason behind it is obviously because Wargaming wants to make ranked incremental, where uh, if you simply play enough, you'll get through ranked at some point. And so if you aren't very early on in the ranked season and you end up getting to the high, and you end up in the higher ranks, for example, let's say five days before ranked season ends, then the people you'll run into at the highest ra- ranked bracket will be probably similar people you would run into in like the second bracket or even the bracket below that at the start of the league. And this usually means that the um, type of gameplay isn't as consistent as it is in a game like Dota because there is no there is no real differentiation between skill. There There is some for a little bit of time at the top, but it only lasts for, let's say, a week or so. Yeah, I would, I would agree with what Aron said there. And, um, you know, I'm actually trying something a little bit different this season for ranked. Um, we all say you can play enough battles and have a good chance to rank out. So this season, instead of focusing on individual wins, um, I'm focusing on number of battles played. And so what I did, because this, the season is short and because I'm going to be going out of town next week, I listed out every date that ranked is available and came up with an anticipated number of games that I think I can play on that day, uh, on that day based off of what other things are going on, you know, work, um, dinner, you know, uh, appointments, whatever. And I came up with a total of 380 battles by the end of ranked. So I am literally keeping a record on my spreadsheet right now of actual battles played. And it's honestly, guys, it's really helped me a lot. I'm probably going to write up a forum post on this, assuming, assuming I rank out um, about how this really helps get rid of a lot of the salt. I've had days with 33% win rates because, well, you know, LOL teams, but um, I, I went to bed saying, you know what? I got my 15 games in. That's what I budgeted. That's what I did. I've done something similar in the past, Zaf, but 
I have a question for you. Is that fun? Because when I did it, it wasn't. You know, is ranked fun? Uh, to me, ranked I, isn't isn't fun. Ranked is a, a marathon. Ranked is playing game after game after game and watching people make stupid mistakes where you have absolutely no power to control and just simply watch as your team dies. That's what ranked is. Sometimes you have those amazing games that you look at and say, yeah, I carry this. But the vast majority of games that you have are just, you know, you look at this. Last night I had an Henri that got dev struck completely broadside in the first two minutes of the game. Later on, I had a Minotaur that was dev struck four minutes in. And it's really hard in a different game. It's really hard to uh, to bounce back from that. Um, and so as a, as a player, you're looking at this, and you're like, oh, here we go again. Um, so innately, in my opinion, ranked isn't fun, okay? But looking at the spreadsheet, at least I can minimize the amount of anger I have towards um, the players, towards the game, towards the mode, whatever. I'm looking at this, and I've played one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've played all eight days of ranked. So far, I'm at 125 battles. I had budgeted 115. So I look at this and say, you know what? I'm 10 battles ahead of where I thought I would be before. So even though I ended up yesterday one star lower than the day before where I ended up, you know what? At least I'm ahead of where I budgeted, and I try to focus on positives here. And to me, this is my positive. I applaud that you can do that, but I, like I said, it's just – at the end of the day, I the last few ranked seasons, I've just stopped playing because it's not fun. And I, I think that's honestly an issue that if the, if if that mode is not fun to play, then why do we have it? Vanessa, do you think no. ranked is fun to play? And I here's the thing, like, I haven't touched rank in quite a while because I've gotten all the rewards that I've wanted out of ranked. So I, I've felt that there's really no honest need for me to be in there and bash my head against a wall or a desk or or whatever. And, you know, if I'm going to play, I'll just, you know, play regular randoms or do the scenarios or something. But to spend time just thinking about doing rank and trying to do the marathon as that's it, no. And just... It, I have no need or want to do that anymore because I've gotten all the stuff that I want for steel. Fear not, dear dear listeners. You At least any one use. person here actually you, 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 really you likes you, so it's a different story, right? I'm not gonna say. I'm who gonna it blame is, it on though. the server. <laughs> I, I don't. I honestly don't think the server makes a difference, though. But um, I actually really enjoy ranked. Well, more than randoms because I like the fact that people are actually trying to win the game. Sure. It doesn't always work out and you get really silly things quite often. I also enjoy the fact when people get really mad and say That's stupid things in chat, them, although I and like don't appreciate it when they to try to intentionally shit. lose the game. Yes, it is. I have seen the screenshots. No, 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 I'm not. No, I'm not. Like, no, I don't. You don't understand. Look, look, you see, on EU, people don't talk in chat. Like, when I go on NA and I play only a handful of games, I get about as much chat interaction as I get, like, from an entire day of playing on EU. Come on, it's 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 really fun to see when people get... Okay, okay. Jokes aside, though. I, I do enjoy ranked because I think it's fun because people are trying to win, which is kind of different from randoms because in randoms, people are trying to deal damage or do whatever objective that is they you know that they have that they're trying to do uh, you, in randoms you'll often have destroyers that simply just ignore caps because if i go into that cap zone that cv is going to attack me so i'm not going to go into that cap zone i'm just going to go and torpedo enemies and hope that you know nobody notifies the cv that i'm there trying to torpedo their team stuff like that happens whereas in randoms uh, the the dd will actually try to capture it'll be annoying for the destroyer player and that's something i hope Wargaming does something about in regards to CVs, but at least people are trying to win. And this means that you get a lot more closer matches where, you know, your team tries to claw back the victory and it won't be and it won't be happening just because the enemy team was like, well, we want more damage, so we're gonna push into this into this one choke choke and then all die and the enemy team wins. 
because that's what often happens in randoms. One of the most annoying strategies and strategies in air quotes in this is that you have one team that doesn't care about the caps and they pull back into one blob on their side of the map, which means that they would 100% lose the game if the enemy team just didn't YOLO rush them. But they are going to YOLO rush them because you get XP for damage rather than winning the game, meaning that uh, you have these throws basically in randoms and they annoy me so much, whereas in in ranked, people would just be like, well, if you're going to sit back there, we'll just take the caps and uh, I guess we'll win. And this is what I like about All right. That. Um, you know, uh, up until this point, I didn't think Kalorn meant anything about playing on a different server. But holy crap, man. Oh, my goodness. I have seen so many throws this season of ranked because they get the team gets up on a on a, you know, advantage in terms of points, in terms of ships, sometimes both. And then what do they do? They just charge in and, you know, try to take uh, another ship out or something in the process they die, and then the next person dies, and then the next person dies. Um, it's it's incredibly frustrating. And to your point about, well, I'll just go get more XP because I can do more damage, that's exactly what I'm seeing a lot of right now in rank, because, of course, if you're the top loser, you don't lose your star. I, I'm actually on Zath's side on this this one, Arun, because, like, I, and, may, and maybe it is a server thing, I don't know. But, I, you know, the... I've seen teams that are up on points uh, uh, like the other day uh, we were up on points and there was a, our team had a Worcester left and the other t- and the enemy team had a, a Montana. All the, our Worcester had to do was run away because we had all three caps at the time. There was no way the Montana was going to get the all, all three caps and we were going to cap out. What did the Worcester do? Do, uh, do you think they were in? Do you think he ran away? He charged a Montana. No, of course not. But but I mean, I think the question is. But I think the question is how often it happens. That that's what I mean. In randoms, it's pretty much guaranteed that that's what's going to happen. In ranked, I would say it's like fifty fifty. Still pretty darn often, <laughs> especially when I tell the team, "No push, we're fine." And then three minutes later, I look and our Yamato is in C cap on North, just being focused by five ships because everybody else said, "Okay." I won't push and I'll stay behind cover and I'll let them come to me. And our Yamato is like, Hey guys, I'm here. Go kill me now. And then we lose the game. So I did want to talk about one, Maybe one the more Yamato thing. Can't read. It was about the Hakuryu. So I was sitting with Kami Samurai and you guys know, all, all know who he is uh, the, this week. And he and I were talking and he's like, have you been playing ranked? And at the time I hadn't played, I played any yet. Cause last week when was my birthday weekend. So I, we were doing a whole bunch of stuff and he said, you should play ranked and you, sh- and you should get a Hakuryu and use it. And I was like, I've li- I, I'm, I said, I'm terrible at the CVs he said ranked is the perfect opportunity to, uh, you know, spend some time and go uh, and learn how to play the carriers, get a Hakuryu. The dive bombers are absolutely disgusting. So I went home and I bought a, a use free XP and bought a, a Hakuryu and I've been playing a Hakuryu in ranked. And it's really surprising to me, just how effective the Hakuryu and in particular its dive bombers are at destroying an enemy team because more often than not I'm up against a midway and the midway cannot hurt the enemy cruisers like uh, like the Hakuryu can yep um I at the start of the season I put out a preview video like my thoughts for the season of ranked and I exactly highlighted that for the Hakuryu and one of my predictions was that at the 5-2 to two bracket in CV battles, you're not going to see a whole lot of ships that just post up. Because if they do, they're just going to get dive-bombed to all heck. Um, Hakuryu is a game changer. It, it forces the battle to be played out in a certain way. If you've got a good Hakuryu captain, of course. Um, Midway can't really do that as well. Midway is a, is a ship where you obviously have your ordnance, you've got your tiny Tims or whatever, and you've got the ability to have a, a good impact on the battle as well, but you have uh, far fewer tools to prevent ships from just dropping anchor and, and saying, this is my spot, come and get me. Aaron, have you been playing uh, the carriers in ranked at all, or are you, have you been sticking to Conqueror? I have played about four games in the midway, and she was okay as far as I saw. Uh, I suppose maybe Hakuria would be better, but I personally would still lean towards Midway. It depends on how many destroyers you run into, because, well, it's much more difficult to hurt destroyers in um, 
in a uh, Hakuryu, sure, your rocket planes work, but once you run out of those, uh, you might not have an option anymore. Whereas Midwales will be like, hey, I had bombers, my dive bombers deal almost as much damage as AP dive bombers because I don't understand why, but they don't over penetrate light armor, meaning that, uh, yeah, that destroyer over there, you just took 8k damage because two bombs decided to clip you. And I. I, th- I think Midway is fairly strong, but but on the other hand, I I won't say that Hakuryu is not stronger, because I think Hakuryu's main advantage is the fact that her torpedoes actually deal damage, unlike Midway's, and as a result of that, I think Hakuryu might have some more longevity, where you can do your dive bomber attacks, you can do your rocket plane attacks, but at least you have some backup at the end, whereas if you're... If you are forced to resort to torpedo bombers on the midway, well, I would say you might as well be secondarying them because it deals about the same I, amount of damage, I've been pleasantly surprised at just how much damage the torpedo bombers on Hakuryu do. I mean, I, I've gotten 8, 9k damage hits per torpedo off of them. Yeah, and midway gets like 3,000, 3,500, 3,700. I mean, yes, because most of them are always going <laughs> right, to miss. Well, we do have a bunch of test ships to talk about, uh, and we're a little bit over half time here. So our first test ship is Smolensk, the tier ton Russian light cruiser with 16 130 millimeter guns in four quad turrets. <laughs> this ship is equipped with a, so- a smoke screen. Kalarn, I, I've got to stop you there. The, the classification of light cruiser is wrong. It is a death cruiser. Thank you. <laughs> Wow, you guys have some strong opinions and we haven't even gotten to the point where I'll let you talk about it. <laughs> uh, she's a, uh, equipped with a smoke screen, paper thin armor, eight kilometer torps and some really floaty shelves. I, I saw another cru- uh, CC describe her as a tier 10 version of Kutuzov and I really don't think that's too far off. Playing her, I found is relatively straightforward With uh, for any USN cruiser player. You basically find an island and shoot over it. Honestly, I feel like you could probably take away her smoke and you would still have a really good ship. Wait, what, what do you mean, floaty shells? The, the, the reason why the Smolensk is OP is because she doesn't have floaty shells, considering her, her caliber. Like, if you compare Smolensk and Colbert, it's like, um, I don't know, Smolensk uh, I'm, feels I'm like Moskva and Colbert feels like... I'm saying like, they're floaty well, enough to get Colbert, over an island if you're sitting behind it. Oh, uh, oh yeah. Um, I guess it's kind of true, but I would say without smoke, Smolensk would definitely be much weaker. She's the She's the squishiest. She's got ship seventy millimeters 10. of armor. Seventy well, one millimeters. With That's anyway. it. Uh, yeah, that is literally the worst, uh, even worse than Colbert by a whole ten millimeters. But what's even worse than that is be- that she only has thirty-two k HP. Harugumo with survivability expert gets twenty-nine k. So you know, just a little bit of perspective. Um, on the other hand, I suppose uh, they are very similar ships, huh? So are we gonna get the Citadel on the Harugumo? Okay, uh, but I mean. Smolensk, though, she puts out a massive amount of DPM. She has seven, sorry, 480k DPM, I, I believe, compared to the Colbert 740k. But I think because you hit so many more shells on the Smolensk, Smolensk might actually have higher effective DPM. Uh, however, of course, you have to keep in mind that these are 130 millimeter caliber guns. And as a result, you can only penetrate 21 millimeters of armor without IFHE. With IFHE, it's a whole 28, meaning that battleships are fairly safe, but cruisers go poof. I mean, I, I found that... So, that yeah. Like, okay, so the game I played, you know, I I had, I had shot 1,236 shells, and I hit 588. That's an incredible hit rate for a ship like this. So I, I do see what you're saying, Arun. It, it, it does hit things easier than Colbert does. Yep, and I think the ship is... It's a lot of fun. Not as much fun as Colbert, but uh, because of the ripple fire. But I think it's more effective. And uh, Smolensk also has torpedoes. They are, they are only 8 kilometers and they're fairly slow and they don't deal much damage. But um, if you're a battleship, you don't really care about that. You see, ter- you know that the ship has torpedoes. You're not going to round the corner at like 2 kilometers on that cruiser. Or at least if you are, you do expect to take massive amounts of damage. Whereas... Uh, a ship that doesn't have torpedoes, you're a battleship and you're like, well, that ship can't do anything if I go around the corner, so I guess I'll just go kill him. Was it a Des Moines? So, <clears throat> okay, fine. But uh, basically, I think the Smolensk is very, very good, but she's incredibly squishy. And so you need to play her in a way where you don't get hit. 
I found one place to play her really well is the new map, Greece. And uh, even though last time I said that it didn't feel like there are certain advantages on one side, uh, in the middle, you ha- on the middle cap, the I think it's the B cap, you have these islands on the northern side, like three islands. And you can sail into the middle of those with the Smolensk and you'll be covered in so many ways that you often don't even need to use your smoke screen. And uh, yeah, that's a perfect place for her because even if people try to blind fire you, they're going to hit the island. And so I would say that you need places like that on a ship like this because you're just so damn squishy. Just random shells can basically end can your game. Struck you? Like you think Minotaur is squishy? No. Minotaur is almost like a battleship in comparison. Okay, maybe not quite. More like a super cruiser, I guess. Like Smolensk is really squishy. If you take the wrong hits with HE from a battleship, you go- you die because you get citadeled. Yeah, you get death struck. It, it's pretty much um, you're either killing everything and just firing away. Or you get death struck. It's pretty much that's it. There, there's no like really in between. Oh, but there is one thing the ship has: anti-air. It's the biggest fat. Okay, it's not the biggest. It's the second biggest fattest middle finger to CVs. The ship that has the biggest one comes later. <laughs> Zath, uh, what is uh, what have you thought about Smolensk? Have you been playing around with it at all? Well, thanks to ranked, I haven't had a lot of time to play much of the test ships. Um, I have played Smolensk, and uh, you know, I mean, she's got smoke. Yes, uh, she's got the Kutuzov capability. Sure. Um, I, I haven't, the, the only time that I felt truly dirty in that ship was when a Shimakaze dirked within five kilometers of me. He didn't last very long. Um, but I mean, that would be a similar experience for the Wooster, Minotaur, a lot of other cruisers. Um, I haven't found the torpedoes to be useful so far. Smoke is nice. It's a comfort thing, I guess. Yeah, I've- I would like to say that uh, oh, I go put on in side. quite a few games in Smolensk uh, so far, and I mean the torpedoes. You know, it's funny you were talking about ships coming around the corner. I've had a lot of people like trying to come around the corner, and they take all the torpedoes and they don't sink because yeah, they don't do a lot of damage. But I mean, they take all the torpedoes, so it's just kind of interesting that. And funny that you say that, because, yeah, no, they still come around the corner, take all the torpedoes, don't die, and then it gets... So, Vanessa, do you play the Pokemon theme when they do that? <laughs> I should. <laughs> I totally should. No, the, here, here's the interesting thing. This ship is, like, when I saw it, and I was looking at it in port, I just, I couldn't stop laughing. And, like, the first game I did was literally just maniacally laughing our our team did really really good and the fact that you know you've got these 130 millimeter shells and i've got the range mod so i'm shooting out to like 18 kilometers and the shells are getting there relatively quickly for their size it's like oh my god this is just 16 guns this is just ridiculous and if you can find a spot where you can shoot and they really can't fire back at you or do anything about it. It's you just have a field day, and it's it's ridiculous. It really is ridiculous. But the moment that people start shooting at you, you're pretty much dev struck. It just even in smoke, like if you're trying to move around, and if a battleship decides to just take a pot shot into that smoke, quite a few times, like I've gotten dev struck, and just like well. That's it. That, that's the ship. It's got all the guns. Um, it says F your planes if you've got a carrier. Um, the torpedoes are interesting. At least it's got torpedoes. But um, the moment that you get focused, you're just you're dead. You're you. I've almost all a good portion of my deaths um, were actually death strucks. It just you don't have any health to take any damage, and you can't take any damage. Well, on the bright side, uh, you don't die to just two Kremlin Citadel hits. It'll take a one one extra overpen for you to go down. Uh, yes, she has that little HP. However, I wanted to address the could the mini Kutuzov part. I, I do see many people claim that, but uh, just to clarify, so that people won't get confused, 
she isn't quite like the Kutuzov because Kutuzov has uh, 152 millimeters of caliber. So if you have IFHE on her, she can penetrate 32 millimeters of armor, which means you can deal damage to standard battleship or through standard battleship armor. This ship cannot. And this means that the battleship will take significantly less damage at tier 8+, plus, which is every battleship we're going to run into, than uh, all the than from a Kutuzov. So it's not quite the same, and I just wanted to put it out there. And also, the ship has a massive downside, and that's the fact that uh, she has squad guns, and they're kind of placed like anti-air guns, to be honest. And this is a downside, because even though you have 16 guns, you can't have some beautiful ripple fire on like a certain other ship, and I find that to be a downside. It's not as fun. That's very true, and it does feel similar to that other ship, um, aside from that the, the, the play style feels like very similar to it. Let's not forget that these are 130mm guns, as you pointed out, Arun, which means, yes, you can't uh, really uh, do a lot of pen damage to 32mm you know, armored battleships. However... Do keep in mind that since they're 130mm guns, that Captain Skills, BFT, AFT, and Extra Marksman will impact those guns. So you can add, you can increase your range, you can increase your rate of fire, and you can increase the rate that you return them, but I don't know why you'd want to do that anyway. Um, yeah, they're so fast, it doesn't even matter. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I think uh, the Russians put, um, what, all the WD-40 on this ship and not on the others? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that. That's obviously not true. Have you not played the Kremlin? Pretty sure that's where all the yeah, WD-40 that one too. went. Between those two ships, that's the one they focused on. I bet they stole all of it from the Japanese. <laughs> well, the, the, you, they, we've been alluding to it for a little while now, but the next ship is called Colbert, uh, another tier 10 Fun. light cruiser. Out of uh, but of the French variety, she too has 16 guns, but 127 millimeter and arranged in a pretty odd layout with wing turrets fore and aft. There's a very narrow window, maybe 10 degrees forward and aft that you can fire the four turrets together, but otherwise the offside wing turret doesn't fire. I actually found Colbert to be harder to use than Smolensk. The speed of the ship I found got her into trouble that Smolensk was not getting into me, uh, into for me. And, and again, you're tempted to use her as an oversized destroyer with her sub ton kilometer concealment. But I got into a lot of situations that I couldn't get out of in Colbert. Uh, and it was situations that I didn't try and get into in Smolensk. If you're closer than 13 kilometers to the enemy, you're pretty much dead. Can't fight, but in that ship, I would definitely recommend, uh, as was mentioned before, because the gun caliber is low on these, 127 even. So we're actually talking that this French cruiser has smaller caliber guns than the French destroyers. but since since they are 127, even with IFHE, you can only pen 27 millimeters of armor, which is like the mines, but not battleships. And as a result of that, you want to uh, you basically aren't gonna DPM ships down because if you could, that would be a bit uh, crazy because she has 740k DPM. Nothing else comes close. We're talking like two Worcesters together in this sense. So if you're a destroyer and you run into a Colbert, I guess you can just... I think you can't even exit the game fast enough because you'll probably die before that happens. Uh, she does such an insane amount of DPM. However, because your gun caliber is low, you can play with BFT, AFT. And I think playing with AFT actually makes a lot of sense. The 18 kilometer ish range. Even though your shells take forever to get there, but because you pepper ship so much, it... Um, it ends up being, like if you're on the receiving end, even though the shells might not deal a lot of damage if you're, say, an Iowa, it's annoying. And it's so annoying that uh, I have played her with maximum range, so we're talking 21 kilometers range. It takes shells 26 seconds to get to the other end. And when I went to a flank, I found a nice island that absolutely no other ship in the game probably can fire over. I could easily fire over it, even when I was next to it, because my shells just go straight up, just like uh, the, sp the space shuttle used to. And, um, yeah, I just yeah, start every How them. many shots did you hit? About 5%. Like, I, I, I hit almost 50% of my shells. Oh, yeah, I know. I would say about 5%. But the, the, but the point is that when ships came into range, like 20 kilometers at the start of the game, I would just start shelling them. It'll be just like a rainbow of fire that 
you know, shells towards them because screw clicking that much. You just hold down the button, by the way, which is really, really, really nice when you take some damage with adrenaline rush because you, uh, you, you, your ripple fire doesn't have a gap in it. It doesn't have a gap in it. It's, it's, it's so nice and smooth and it just rolls over. Anyway, uh, back to the point. I had 21 kilometer range and ships came into the range on that side of the map at 20 kilometers. I would start chilling. And what I noticed is that uh, the ship I started chilling would turn around. I would pick another target. The ship I would start chilling would turn around. And I think about three minutes in, uh, the enemy abandoned the flank entirely. Even though I did like 5k damage, maybe. Just the fact that there were so many shells incoming, they were like, nah, we're out of here. And uh, I wonder if this kind of uh, psychological warfare will exist later on as well. And if it does, I think that might be a very nice way to play. Well, maybe not really, but I do recommend the 18 kilometer version. Because if you're like over 15 kilometers from every single enemy, you can actually open water fire on enemies with your speed boost and try to dodge it as you can. Because... They might hit you, but you're fairly fast at 40 knots with the speed boost. And uh, they'll take a lot of damage, though, because you do start a few fires. You know, I, I just want to share one of my favorite experiences in the uh, Colbert, and that was when a, a buddy of mine uh, and I were divisioned playing on Hotspot. We're south of ACAP, and a Minotaur is in there. And uh, he remarked, this is, this is such a pain in the butt. This guy is just going to block us in. I said, hold my beer. And I just charged right in, loaded AP, and that guy just evaporated. Boy, was that fun. Oh, while holding down the left mouse button, of course. Speaking of, uh, well, ships that do capping stuff and etc. One thing I noticed is that, uh, you know when you see a smoke screen appear in like a cap zone at the start of the game? If you have the range and an island to hide behind as a cold bear, just start shooting the smoke screen. Even if you're very far away and you're very unlikely to hit, you put out so many shells that uh, many destroyers are like, nah, I'm out of here. Or they'll just get hit once in a while and it'll delay their capping. And if you're a destroyer in that situation, that is supremely annoying. But yeah, Colbert is fun. She's, I don't know, that ripple fire thing is one of the most uh, satisfying things I have done in this game. It's kind of like what when you first get the Wooster and you're just like, all right, this is kind of fun. And then you get the, the Colbert and you're like, this is what I imagined Wooster would be, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's be- I think it's because of the large number of guns, though, rather than the fact that uh, uh, I would say Wooster probably in a real game does similar amounts of damage as a Colbert, maybe slightly less. But it's not quite the same when you have, uh, you know, when you don't quite fire as quickly and when you don't, and when you salvo fire instead of that kind of ripple fire. I, I guys, I I don't find this ship fun. I I really How? don't. I do. I I I I hate ships like this. Like I don't have Minotaur. I don't have Worcester. I tested both of them. I have no desire to own either one of them. Like they drive me crazy. Uh, even Smolensk drives me a little crazy. But at least it's got a a, a smoke screen. You know, actually, I, I just thought of a way to explain um, the ship to other players. And uh, you reminded me of it. It's because you're a battleship player, isn't it? But you see, the way the ship plays is basically this. If you had manual control of your secondaries, <clears throat> this is what you would basically get. Well, in the case of quite a few battleships anyway. It's just, you fire so much, and it's so much fun. And I don't understand how you don't find it fun. How? I just like to do damage when my shells hit something, and nothing happens when your damn shells hit something in Colbert. That's true. That's true. Unless it's a destroyer. That's true. Well, actually, I guess cruisers can take damage too. It's just that you don't hit cruisers for some reason because they're too maneuverable. <laughs> Maybe it's the rainbows. Yeah, I suppose I suppose having over 15 seconds of shell travel time at not even that long range is uh, a bit of an issue. Vanessa, what, what are your thoughts on Colbert? But, but what about all those uh, ribbons? You get all the ribbons. Well, you have to actually hit the target, though, don't you? I'm pretty sure hitting yeah, the water doesn't, you know, count. I'm sure, you know, there's that stationary battleship that you can just sit there and get all the ribbons. It's not like you're doing anything, though. But Nothing happens. Well, I mean, let, let's be fair, though. I'm literally holding my head in let, my hand. Let's be fair, though. 
I'm not sure if hitting that stationary battleship is even that easy. You see, it takes a while for the shells to get there, and even battleships can quite often simply be like, no, I'm just going to accelerate. Sorry. Sorry, guys. I'm just accelerating. All right, guys, we have one more test ship that we need to talk about. And I know I know Vanessa wants to talk about this ship uh, because it's been long awaited by quite a few people. Summers is a tier 10 USN destroyer, actually a destroyer leader, according to uh, the, the history books that I've read with a massive torpedo armament, good alpha strike guns. She kind of pays for it with almost no AA capability, making her a bit of an odd duck in the USN lineup. I played her as the USN version of some of the IJN destroyers, you know, kind of a torpedo boat with guns that can be used in dire situations. And frankly, the 16.5 kilometer torps are absolutely devastating. The three uh, quad torp launchers are much more flexible than the dual quintuple launchers that I find on gearing, but that lack of AA can really come and bite you in the butt in this current carrier meta. Now that said, I'm a little worried about this, that, this is a better torpedo boat than the IJN destroyers, which are supposed to be the torpedo destroyers in the game. Well, they don't deal as much damage per torpedo, and I think that's the biggest downside. I do I do agree that they're very, 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 very good. Uh, they have much... Basically, they're like Shimakas, except their torpedoes have good concealment. And because of that, I think the Summers is quite fun. However, the anti-air or lack of anti-air that you mentioned is actually a... I think it's a... I think it's a deal breaker because remember how I mentioned at the start about CVs, how you drop a fighter on them? Summers can't kill that fighter. It just cannot. Sure, other destroyers might have weak anti-air, but they'll at least be able to kill fighters off rather quickly. Summers can't. She just doesn't do anything. You'll just be spotted and have to sail out of the range of that fighter. And so I think, um, I kind of hope that they're going to add some kind of anti-air for it. Um, But yeah, the Summers guns feel meh. The torpedoes feel great, and that's kind of everything she has going for her. I think the torpedoes are basically gearing torpedoes, except you have 12 of them, and I think they reload faster because you have three sets of quads instead of uh, quints, and that's kind of it. Guns aren't told purpose. Yeah, but the torpedoes have a significantly less reload time than on uh, gearing. At least, well, you know, that, there's that's, 16. That's the... Point five kilometer That's torpedo. the quad aspect, I think, right? Isn't aren't isn't torpedo reload related to how many torpedoes you have in a set? Yeah, supposedly. Supposedly, but not necessarily. But to go back to you know the comparison to IGN destroyers, you know, IGN destroyers, especially the higher tier ones, can often take the torpedo reload booster um, that you don't have here. So yes, you can stagger out and be a bit spammy. Uh, with the torpedoes and they are good and my overall impression of the ship is i actually really like it i you know it, it's funny you in, talk about the guns and you know they are a bit different like i've tried to um gun out against some other destroyers and the it was the battles were interesting to say the least but it is a very capable ship and the thing that did shock me was the aa i was rather shocked when you know kind of looking at it and what we were going to get so i did not feel that we would have a usn destroyer that lacking in aa and that initially made me think well why would you even bother to take a gearing because of how you know the the summers on paper should be a lot better but those guns aren't dual purpose so you really have no aa but in some sense, though, I think that also kind of helps a little because the speed of Summers is really good, even without the speed flag. And then you've got the speed booster since you don't have AA and your base AA range is really, really small. Like you're going to get air detected before you even so you don't have to really worry about turning off your AA and you just zip on out of there with with great speed when you are getting spotted now if the carrier is trying to focus you then you're not going to have a fun day but that's with any destroyer in the current meta so i mean i i've quite enjoyed the games that i've played so far in the ship zeth what about you uh how do you find summers to fit in at the tier 10 meta um you know i'd echo the the thoughts about the anti-air obviously 
it's not going to be a destroyer that you can go out and scout and stuff like that with uh, carriers and that sort of thing. Radar off, of course, is still going to be a hard counter to it. Um, the guns are pure fun. I do enjoy them. Uh, and the torpedoes are quite nice when you can, uh, you know, get the right angles and that sort of thing. Um, you know, she plays she plays uh, a little bit different than uh, the other USN destroyers, which is nice. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of talk about the gearing Kaze players that will take a gearing and just basically use it as a torpedo boat because, hell, well, why not? Um, and I think that uh, we're going to have summer Kazes here. Um, with, with the same general principle. So, um, plus it's got the smoke. It, it's it's just an all around fun ship, and uh, you know I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what Wargaming does with her. I think you know going back to you know what Glorn did say with the ship. You know she's a destroyer leader. I think this ship with other destroyers is going to be a lot of fun. With those people who take destroyer divisions. I think they're really going to like this ship. Do you think that the three ships that we talked about today, Summers, Smolensk, and Colbert, do you guys think that they will make it into the game without major changes? Summers, maybe. The other two, no way. No way. No way at all. I don't see that happening. Well, actually, maybe not. Maybe there won't be major changes, but they're definitely getting nerfed in some way. I just cannot imagine that they're not. I think their fire chance is likely to take a hit. Vanessa, Zath, what about you guys? Do you think that these ships will make it in the way they are? I think Summers might be okay, but it is interesting that the speed on Summers torpedoes, I think, is a little quicker than standard USN torpedoes, so that's kind of interesting. But yeah, like, I I mean, if someone even targets you in Smolensk, you, you, you literally... And often get death struck if they connect with their hits. And it's not like that's difficult to do. I mean, you're not in like a really tiny Minakaze here. You're you're gonna get hit. And you know, it's the trade-off, it's the ultimate glass cannon at the moment. And that can be really hard to balance because a really awesome player is gonna take that ship, put it in a position, and just absolutely go to town with it where someone else you know they might sail in get spotted and then wiped off and and they did nothing they contributed nothing and so you know how is wargaming going to look at all the statistics and stats and go well how how do we balance this how do we take that and you know look at all that data i i don't know i don't know how you would do that and i just testing the ship like I I can't imagine these ships like out in the wild where everyone, you know, can essentially get them. Ooh, I don't know. I they I do feel they need some some balancing and I don't know what Wargaming's going to do. So it's interesting. You know, every ship goes through changes as it gets tested and those ships of course have been uh through changes previously when the developers were playing with them and the super testers were playing with them. Um, and then now when the community contributors are able to play with them too. So there's an awful lot of data uh, and feedback that Wargaming is going to receive. And ultimately, it's up to them to decide uh, what, what they think works best for the ships and for the state of the game. So I would not be surprised if all three of these ships were touched in some way, shape, or form before they are officially released. We've seen some ships take you know six months to finally be ready for release. Uh, we've some, seen some ships just, you know, come out and, hey, perfect, good, send it, ready to go. So uh, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, one thing, if you don't mind, Kalorn, uh, to get on the soapbox for a second to, to mention to your, your listeners is you all see community contributors uh, playing these games and releasing content, YouTube videos, whatever, talking about how crazy and fun and OP the ship is. Keep in mind that ships can and will change. A great example of that is very recently when the Kremlin was released, there was a threat on the forum. Wait a minute, where's my radar? That ship originally came with radar. It was displayed as such by some of the community contributors, and so everybody's expecting that. And they didn't realize or follow the changes that occurred in the ship. So they were expecting a ship that would be a certain way, and it didn't turn out that way. So, you know, I think it's important for people that are listening to this to be thinking about that and saying, hey, you know, just because I'm looking at the ship now and, oh, my God, so-and-so says it's amazing and great and fun, 
doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be that way when it's actually released. Could even be more fun. Who knows? Press X to doubt about that last one. I don't think it gets much more fun than that, unless you start dealing damage. But I wanted to mention that one of the one of the reason, well, or rather the reasoning why I think she's going to get nerfed. Imagine you're on the receiving end of a Colbert. Now imagine if there's three of them in one division. I don't see how that's going to make it into the game. That's just too much, I think. Even though technically you're not going to take much more damage because you'll be on fire anyway and uh, they can't really penetrate your deck armor if you're a battleship, but I think the effect of three of them at once is a bit too much and you'll probably get more than three of them at once if they were added into the game as they are right now. And uh, I just don't think that's likely to end up in the ma in the game. Alrighty. Well, uh, we have three more that I, uh, ships that I wanted to talk about this week uh, that are the the test ships that had some updates, but we will save that for next week. Uh, I do want to uh, touch on a question of the week, uh, and the reason that uh, that I'm throwing this out here is that we had uh, somebody that asked it and actually asked it twice because I missed it the first time. So this is a, a long question, and it's got academic re re references. So let's dig in. So the, the question this week comes from IJN Yamato BB17 on the forums, who has a pretty long question, like I said, with the economic re re uh, reference sources. He says, since the tier nine German battleship, the Frederick de Grossa has clearly based off the H39 class battleship, should Wargaming rename her to one of the names that was actually designated for the H39s? The two names that were going to be given to the two H39s uh, that were laid down was Ulrich von Hutten and Götz von Birkenwigen. Uh, th these two names are what uh, Adolf Hitler would have given the, the ships if they were actually completed, because just like Deutschland, the, he feared any loss of a capital ship named after Germany or the German command. This is well documented in the, the, the book uh, Hitler's Table Talk, uh, 1941 to 1942, with an introductory essay on the mind of Adolf Hitler by H.R. Trevor Roper. So uh, IJ Yamato goes on to here to quote his sources, which you can read for yourself in the podcast forum area. They are pretty extensive. And yes, now that he, uh, that even though both ships were scrapped before 1942, if they remained in construction by the, the, the time they were commissioned, it would have been 1943 or 44, thus being christened with those two names. Do you think that, the, that these names should have been used in World of Warships? I really have no opinion on this because I don't think the name matters that much. It doesn't really affect gameplay and, uh, well, at least for me, the name just doesn't matter. If they want to rename them, sure. Uh, in fact, in fa actually, I wouldn't mind if they renamed the tier 10 one, the Grossa Kofest, because the name is just kind of weird. It's it's like the Great Elector. I don't know. Sounds like a weird name. I would disagree with names mattering, because, and, and I know you clarified that, but for a lot of people, especially there's a lot of people who play this game for the history, uh, and that does very much matter to them. I would have to say, as far as the question is concerned, um, I'd have to look more at the individuals. I'm not really up on the history of these two individuals. If they were, um, it, if there was controversy behind them, then I could see why Wargaming would not. Um, but I'd also, mm, there's, there's a lot of, touchy areas um in particular with subjects especially with germany during world war ii so i could see where wargaming would probably rather tiptoe around some things and maybe just go with something more generic to not necessarily draw attention or you know kind of focus on things that might draw attention other than you know, positive attention to the game. Well, both names are from the 16th century, so it's kind of unrelated, I think, out in terms of controversy, at least as far as I know. Not necessarily. It just, you know, <laughs> there there's been myriads and thousands and thousands upon years of history other than the, you know, however many couple decades of the Nazi Reich. So there's, you know, in modern eyes we tend to judge things instead of how you know necessarily they were judged for their time and that because of that there is a lot of 
things that can be drawn upon and uh, controversies, controversies that can be brought up. So, you know, again, I, I, I don't know too much these particular these two particular individuals but again just kind of addressing the point as a broad stroke i could see you know maybe just kind of going with something generic not to necessarily draw negative attention and you know i i could i could go and i could research these individuals and because you know they were um they you know we had the rename of the uh republic wasn't that rename? Wasn't it something yeah, different France. before? France. Yeah, France. So, I mean, you know, there's, if this was something that, you know, was a, a positive, you know, talk on the forums and say, hey, you know, these individuals, you know, why, why not? The, you know, that's, Wargaming has, has a precedence for that. But again, just kind of addressing the issue broadly, I think that's probably why they might have chosen the names that they did just to you know try and you know want to look at these ships in a positive light and not necessarily draw i mean you saw what happened when you know some controversies when a certain argentine ship joined the game and that was relatively small but it is those things that wargaming has to think about zath did you have any thoughts before i I throw in my two cents oh i have many Uh uh-huh First and foremost, I would say if it really bothers a person that much, then um, they can go and change the name in the game files. I'm actually looking at it right now. While you guys were talking, I was taking a look at that, and I found a guide um, on the Steam community about doing that. Obviously, I haven't done it myself, but I know that there are people who have renamed ships like the Audacious, changing it to something else. So Yeah, it's pretty easy. Yeah. So, I mean, if it bothers you that much as a player, then go and edit the file and change it to the name that you'd rather it be. Um, for example, the USS Lexington in the game isn't the Lexington. It's the Saratoga. The Lexington went down before it changed out of its 208 millimeter guns. But do I care enough to change the game? No. <laughs> Does it trigger me every time I play it? Slightly. But it doesn't have any real impact on my overall enjoyment of the game. Well, and, you know, New Orleans isn't actually New Orleans. It's a bastardization of a bunch of different ships. Um, there's a there's a bunch of different examples within the game of, of ships that are called something that they aren't necessarily what they are. And, and in fact, we call, you know, uh, Frederick de Grossa an H-39, and she's clearly based off of those designs, but both Frederick de Grossa and the Grossa Kerfurst have, are not one-for-one representations of those H-class design guides. So, you know, you kind of have to keep that in mind as well. Uh, that, And the other thing is that I know where these ship names came from. They were Dreadnought and, and Super Dreadnought names uh, of World War One ships. And I think Wargaming felt that it was going to be less controversial in, in vain with what Vanessa said to you reuse names that already had been used by the the you know the the german empire in in world war one so in that sense i don't really have too much of a problem with it if these ships were very clearly the h39s then or the h41s or whatever then i would have probably feel stronger about what name they got used but because they're really just not what was intended in history in terms of those designs. I think that Wargaming has at least a little license to use whatever name they want. Did you guys have any uh, closing thoughts on this or any of the other things we talked about today? Yeah. Hill is a good ship. Hope to talk about it some, uh, maybe yeah, in the we next show. We'll, we'll talk about Hill. Well, uh, Zath, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. Uh, we enjoyed having you and uh, it's good to talk to you about both, you know, clan battles and all these other things. So. Yeah, no problem. Uh, it's great to be here. I, I definitely enjoy that uh, the last hour and a half of not having to play ranked. Erin, <laughs> uh, Vanessa, did you guys have any announcements before we close up? Nope. Alrighty. Well, that's it for this week, folks. Don't forget to tune in next week uh, to hear our impressions about those other test ships that we didn't talk about, including Hill, as Vanessa wanted, to, uh, Vanessa said, uh, we do have a new spot on the NA forums just for the Worships podcast. It is where you can put in your questions of the week, uh, uh, and you can look for the the sources from our question from today. 
uh, check for that link in the description. As always, follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash worship podcast and Twitter at worships podcast for updates between episodes. Don't forget to check out Erun on YouTube and Twitch as well. And Zath, I think you do your wreath play theater on YouTube, correct? Yes. Yeah, so I typically uh, stream them live on Twitch, typically on Saturdays or Sundays, 1 to 3 p.m. Central Time. And then I split those replays up and I will release those on YouTube, um, typically four per week. So, yep, exactly. And people can submit replays to you how? Uh, easiest way is to email me. It's lordzathna at gmail.com. L-O-R-D-Z-A-T-H at gmail.com. Uh, I've had some people send them to me via Discord, others via um, message on the forum. Uh, those all work too, but uh, sometimes I lose them. So it's easier just to send it through email. All righty. Uh, we, of course, want to thank our amazing Patreon backers. If you're interested in supporting us, please consider becoming a backer yourself. Backers are what make the podcast possible, and we couldn't do it without you guys. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.